In the annals of criminal history, few stories are as chilling and haunting as that of Robert Black, a man who harbored a sinister secret, a history of predatory behavior, and a trail of missing and murdered children in his wake. But it was the tireless efforts of law enforcement, the meticulous process of investigation, and the advancement of forensic technology that ultimately brought him to justice. This is a tape-recorded interview. The date is 11 17 of 84. In this new series, I'm going to take you on a journey into the dark heart of the police interrogation room. Using cutting-edge lip-sync technology, we'll bring to life the actual taped confessions of some of the world's most notorious murderers. And bring you face to face with evil. Put it into the sleeping bag. No, I just slung it in the corner. And along with forensic psychologist Professor Michael Brooks, I will analyze their interviews in unparalleled detail. And while he was asleep, I, I put a noose around his neck. I told him with the noose, and he hardly struggled. Like the police detectives who interviewed them, you'll experience firsthand their cold and calculating minds. I've never gotten a mum. Um, uh, I knew that she favoured Mrs. Jamie. Trying genuinely to understand what made him tick. They're incredibly graphic at times, they're harrowing and I don't think I will ever get Robert Black's voice out of my mind. 20 years on, I can still hear it. Tighter hands. Found a sticky plaster. Put the plaster over a mat. Put that pillowcase or whatever it was, and the cushion cover over her head. Put her into the sleeping bag. No, I just slung it in the car. Black was taking a huge gamble in offering Wire an insight into the mechanisms of his mind. But it was a calculated one that he believed may be his only route to freedom. There is always a case for trying to get to the bottom of the reasons for some horrific acts. And few could be more horrific than Black's. And one of the things that people ask time after time is, no, I, OK, I understand what he did. I understand myself. If you ask myself why, I've got this fascination or weakness or whatever I want to call it. When Black and Wire first met, the paedophile had only been charged with kidnapping and sexual assault on a minor. He was only caught by accident. He abducted a girl in broad daylight in a little street in which opposite was a retired postmaster mowing his lawn. When he bent down to empty the box with the cuttings in it, he noticed a girl's legs disappearing into the air. They were clearly being placed in the back of her transit van. The postmaster was horrified, rushed into the house, the police were called, and then suddenly, driving back towards them, was the same transit van. A police officer steps in front of it, the van swerves, stops. Black is taken out of the van and one of the officers discovers the girl hidden in a sleeping bag tied gagged with a bag over her head and the extraordinary coincidence is that the officer who discovered her 
discovered his own daughter. It was his daughter that had been abducted by Black. And the tragedy, of course, was that Black had already assaulted her. And it was only that complete coincidence that brought Black's career as an aggressive paedophile murderer to an end. But it was to be some time before he was actually convicted of any murder. Unwanted by his own family, Wire learned how Black was shunted from care home to care home until he ended up being fostered by the Tulip family. At school, they used to call him Smelly Bobby Tulip because his personal hygiene could best be described as indistinct. He was a nasty, smelly, unhappy, rather strange little boy. I remember one Christmas I didn't get no Christmas presents because I'd been bad. Got one present, somebody that lived out of town. It was a football. I can't remember what I'd done, you know, but... She says, Santa Claus isn't coming this year to you. And he didn't. He developed very, very quickly, at a very early age, a fascination, not only with his own genitalia, but also with the genitalia of girls. Uh, there is a story that at the age of five, he uh, manipulated a girl into showing him her genitalia, which only increased his fascination. And one of the fascinations, and one of the most chilling aspects of black, was that he very quickly, and this is a very young age, between five and eight, he very quickly developed a habit of inserting things into himself, into his own anus, and into the vaginas of small girls he came in touch with. He was a deeply, deeply troubled child. In 1958, when Black was 11, both his foster parents, the Tulips, died and he was relocated to another foster family who had a daughter. He could not stop himself interfering with the daughter of the house. He was sent to a very brutal care home and Black was forced to perform sex acts on various members of the staff. And he didn't. Michael Robert Black talking to the sex therapist Ray Wire. Again, one of the things that Black reveals uh, to Ray Wire is that Black himself was abused as a child. Have you personally ever worked with a paedophile that wasn't abused as a child? Well, not all paedophiles will reveal the information uh, about their early life history. They have to be in a particular setting to want to do that. So if they're in a therapeutic setting, they're much more likely to disclose their, their sort of early life experiences. Don't you feel that sometimes, again, what we're hearing from Black is Black trying to create in the listener sympathy for Black? I'm not sure that that's, that's his motive. I, I think it, it, he's much more controlling around that. He's much more controlling in, in the information that he, that he gives and therefore it's to satisfy his own needs. Even this idea that he didn't get any Christmas presents, Santa Claus isn't going to come to him this year, all those kinds of things that he reveals about his own childhood, which seem to me to be real techniques of neutralization. You know, these are, these are permissions he's granting himself because of the trauma that he had as a child. Sure, and those, so he's providing a rationale for why he's done what he's done, but that doesn't necessarily mean that he wants to elicit sympathy from the interviewer. In his interview with Ray Wire, Black reveals how in 1963, when he was just 16 years old, his soft voice and mild manner enabled him to develop his deadly craft. Just 
Phillips and then the park and Greenock by the swings. And all the other kids had gone except for the one little girl. And I asked her if she wanted to see let's see kitten. I knew where there was kittens. The voice of Robert Black could be, in fact, the voice of a child entertainer, of a child storyteller. It was a voice that probably had evolved and developed in talking, charming children, in engaging children, in not frightening off children. Um, it's probably why his voice sends a chill down the back of most people. She came with me. And so we were going into the, from was an area shell, she said that uh, it was dark and she wanted to get out again. She started to cry. Because of the way Black described things, for Ray it felt like he was there with him in that air raid shelter or wherever he was. And Ray, that was a unique experience. Not pleasant, but um, a unique experience in which he could be with Robert Black as he's, you know, squeezing this child's throat. I think I clapped my hand over her mouth and held her down on the ground. My hand round her throat and holding her down. And uh, she must have gone unconscious anyway. And uh, I masturbated there. Went out, left her. You didn't know that she was alive or dead? No. He fondled her, which was the phrase used at that time, but he was not prosecuted. He was, in the phrase, admonished. All that did was give Black an excuse. No one really minded what he did. No one was too concerned. Well, I can get away with it. Black moved to London to find work as a van driver. On his journeys, he noticed the CD sex shops along the Caledonian Road. In the pre-internet age, they would become his portal to the evil world he would come to completely inhabit. It was uh, the place where I used to go to get, where I first discovered the channel. Shop down near King's Cross, and that didn't have a name, it was just like a shop front. And you went in, and it was like a little books lined up, but you wanted to get something else. You went in the back. He would go to the sex shop, and there was always something more. He would ask, You have anything about teenagers? which was shorthand or cipher for children. That was all child no, I made the chance remark. I, I said, uh, uh, had, had he any, like, teenage sex magazines? He says, I've got these, and he hauled them out, and they're called lolly tots. As time goes on, he became more and more a regular customer. The shop owner would allow him to move further and further into the shop. And as you go into the back of these shops, that's where the hardcore child porn and things like that were kept but it was a kind of a, a process where you had to be accepted you had to be talking the right language uh, to be moved up to a higher level of porn in my mind the ideal situation would be a child that was completely willing and eager oh. somebody once said to me that their motto was uh, when they're big enough they're old enough I tended to agree with that. This was ideal for him because he didn't have a boss over him. As long as he delivered the goods in the right place at roughly the right time, he was allowed to do what he wants when he wanted. And this gave him the opportunity to go looking for children, which he did. 
he would go to parks, he would observe children, try and see the ones that were on, it, on their own so that he could make contact with them. As the interviews progressed, Wire's laid-back approach was eliciting ever-increasing detail from Black about his M.O. Coming up from, like, like from when we went walking away, like, up through Wadsworth, heading home, I would be seen. Looked about ten. She went into the side streets and the back streets, like, I followed and I was out of the van. And, uh, well, she screamed and ran. One of the most noticeable um, aspects of Robert Black's killing was they were done during the summer holidays, July, August, when children are more vulnerable. They're at, left out playing, uh, the, the evenings are lighter, they're, they're left on their own more or with the other young children. He took the opportunity, time and time again, to kill during the summer holiday. He would literally sit beside playgrounds watching the children and seeing if one of the girls was less, how can I put it, less looked after than the others. He would befriend the loner, or the one who seemed to have been abandoned, or the one who wasn't quite with anyone. If he saw someone he thought of as a suitable victim, he would assess very, very carefully the circumstances. He would double back, he would drive round, he would check what's the likelihood of me being caught? And if it was clear to him that he could do this and not be caught, he would grab the child, bundle her into the back of the van, and take her away to abuse and ultimately to kill her. It was a tactic that he used with, in the end, devastating effect. He developed a series of really quite appalling uh, techniques. He would put elastoplast or sicking plaster over the child's mouth after having put his hand across it. He would tie her up. He would put her into a sleeping bag. He would tie her legs. He would put a hood over her head. He would pull the sleeping bag over her head because that way she became literally his prey. He had a, a crime kit. He would have a sleeping bag. He would put the child in the sleeping bag. He would rape the child uh, several times, tie them up, and then eventually strangle them and dispose of the body. It's suspected on several occasions he actually went back to the bodies, but we don't know whether he just masturbated over them or whether he engaged in other sexual activities. It's painful to say it, but so many times in Black's life, the victims would have been kept alive for at least some hours. It is horrific even to consider what they may have suffered at his hands. One of Ray Wire's skills as an interviewer was never to pass judgment or admonish. It was an approach that worked, encouraging Black to disclose his twisted logic. He had this really weird idea, and again, it's in total denial and, and diminishing of what he was doing. Was He wanted people to believe, and I think he wanted to believe it himself, that in strangling a child and making her unconscious, he would somehow not be hurting her. So he, that's something that kept um, cropping up in the interviews. I didn't want to hurt her, but he'd render her unconscious. So surely to get to even that stage, she would have had to suffer. But that's what he wanted, uh, that's what he wanted certainly Ray to believe, and that's what he tried to believe himself. It seems strange, but you don't want to hurt children, that they die. But in, in the dying, you said that you didn't want them to suffer. Whatever you were going to do, you didn't want them to be in pain. 
there's sometimes, you know, I think about being unconscious rather than a drunk or drug or something like that. A sex abuser has to distort his thinking and his belief to give himself permission to abuse. Hearing it from Black, uh, Ray learnt just how far a man had to go, an offender has to go, to uh, get to that point. I think he always knew just how offenders could distort their thinking, but I don't think he'd ever seen it used quite so horrifically. I think it's an insight into how um, they think, the language they use in order to justify, to minimise, to deny. We need to get hold of that language. One of the reasons Black evaded capture for so long was that the children he abducted and murdered were often dumped hundreds of miles from their homes. Most killers dispose of the body as quickly as possible uh, to create a larger window between when they, they dispose of the body and then when they're, they're investigated by the police. But he didn't dispose of the body near the site where he found the victim. He would often drive two, three hundred miles away and then dispose of the body. And he had favourite stops on his routes from London to Northern Ireland to Scotland where he would have a break. Taking a body hundreds of miles is a very unusual activity. It also shows that he wanted to be connected with the child. He'd obviously sexually assaulted them, killed the child, but he still wanted to have that connection with the child. What's going on? Don't. Maybe there was that paper girl went missing. Tate. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. She disappears. Most serial killers are to some degree narcissistic. Robert Black was no exception. He could be lured, as it were, into revealing information by, as it were, appealing to his ego and to actually ask his opinion of this girl and how he would treat her. He would spill the beans that little bit too far and reveal information that could only be known to the killer. And how did you think he did? Well, they, they found her bike, didn't they? Yeah. She obviously either persuaded her to get off her bike or grabbed her off the bike, one of the two. Got her in a vehicle and took her away. Why'd you believe that? It seemed obvious, didn't it? Yeah. By now, Wire was convinced Black was a multiple murderer, but knowing he was not about to make a full confession, he tried a different tactic. Ray was, one of his techniques is, was assumption making. So he would interview, but he'd make an assumption of what happened next. And so the person being interviewed would just assume he knew <laughs> and, and respond accordingly. Because at that point, he wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't be able to say, he was no longer in control, in the sense, of the interview. That's, that's what Ray did. When you thought about Tate, what feelings did it give you when you thought about him doing it? I think that's like how I started off with the, the scenario. Yeah. What would you do? Same, if I've seen a paper bill, like a, maybe park and watch for a while. Yeah. See what sort of route. Getting myself in a position where it would be possible to take somebody. There was that paper girl went missing. Tate. Yeah, that's her name. Yeah. She disappeared. She never turned up. I was intrigued by Ray Wire questioning Black about the abduction of Jeanette Tate and Black's widely suspected of having abducted that little girl. Were you surprised by how Black responds to the kinds of questions Wires put, puts to him? No, b b because most serial offenders will want to hold back information. They will want to be in control of certain elements. Now, if it is clear that they've been um, 
convicted, perhaps, or if it's very apparent that who it was that they killed, then actually they know that they can talk around that. But if there is confusion or uncertainty, then they can hold that back and be in control of that information, knowing that others want it and being able to almost have it as part of a, of, of a ransom, really. But isn't it interesting that Ray Wire uses Jeanette Tate's name? Black depersonalizes everything that he says whilst nonetheless revealing his MO. He reveals how it is that he carries out certain attacks, and that's very explicit, and, and that gives us that understanding of, of, of his modus operandi, of, of his reason for, for operating. But he doesn't want to confess to the killing of Tate. He wants to hold that back. He wants it, to, in case he wants to use it at a later stage for his own purposes. However, despite discussing aspects of his crimes, Black wasn't revealing the full extent of them. I said, clap my hand over her mouth and held her down on the ground. It's my hand round her throat and hold her down. She must have gone unconscious anyway. And uh, I masturbated there. And went out, left her. Until his final days, Black tried to explain away his crimes. When killers choose to confess, they can often be candid, but their aim is to generate our sympathy for them. They, of course, feel none for their victims. They have no genuine empathy. Robert Black's confessions provide a chilling insight into the mind of a murderer and a reminder of how serial murderers follow patterns that allow every killer to create their own deadly and unmistakable signature. This pattern of behavior is based on the idea that their sexual interest objects are literally objects, not human beings, uh, and that this carves a way of dealing with other people whereby their own sexual satisfaction is the major thing in their lives and the major important thing in achieving these engagements with children. They're not, as it were, charming a child, taking them away um, to, to actually engage them in some kind of relationship. They are just simply objects to be what they want them to be so that they can gain sexual satisfaction, not with that person, but using that person. There was a girl on her own in the flats when I was delivering. And I sat down and talked to her for a few minutes later. Mm -hmm. I try and touch her. Sometimes succeeded, sometimes not. He treats them as an object. They're not sentient people. They're not a little girl. They are just objects for his sexual satisfaction. I don't know how many children. It could be in the same In the case of Jeanette Tate, he would begin to talk about it and then that would be dropped. And that might be dropped for one or two sessions and then picked up again in the next one. And then again, the one after. And it's only when you assemble the tiny fragments of what he said about Jeanette Tate that you begin to understand what black was trying to hint at, but was never, ever going to confess to. Upon Black's arrest for child abduction in 1990, police forces around the country began to pool their resources. Before long, he became the prime suspect in a series of unsolved child murders that had spanned over a decade. Robert Black, in common with many serial killers, realizes that at the point where you're arrested and you are not likely to be let go, you are now powerless. You are going to be told what to do with the rest of your life. 
Therefore, any piece of power, any kind of sense of control over others is absolutely vital to them, and they will almost always withhold some information. Providing that information is of value to someone else, they can feel that they are in a position of power and will sometimes take that information to the grave. They then got in the van. Yeah, but they were in the front setting off on the seat. You've got to be honest with me, Robert. Got to be. What year is this? Say, uh, 85, 86. One of the things you do is you try and work out what their style is. Some people, you appeal to their intelligence, some people, you appeal to their uh, humanity. Sometimes you have to be a father confessor and play the, the role of just almost listening and letting somebody tell their story slowly and just every now and then put in a question to check the information and allow them to talk. And it's played by different people at different levels at different times. But the aim is to get as much of the truth as possible. We never get the whole truth, partly because the killer doesn't know the whole truth themselves. They haven't come to reality of what they've done. They then got in the van. Yeah, but they were in the front setting off on the seat. You've got to be honest with me, Robert. Got to be. What year is this? It's uh, 85, 86. Sorry. One of the things that interests me in those tapes is the sense in which Wire doesn't judge Black. People hearing that tape, and you and I have interviewed many, many paedophiles, why don't we react to some of the things they tell us? Because if we did, then there's a likelihood that they will stop disclosing. Michael, both you and I are very publicly identified with the cause of offender prison rehabilitation. Robert Black, could he have been rehabilitated? I think it's highly unlikely. I think we have to recognise that for certain individuals, rehabilitation is probably not a possibility. And therefore, it's a question of how best do you look after them. Robert Black died in prison in 2016 just days before he was to be charged with the abduction and murder of Jeanette Tate from some 30 years previously. That final charge laid against him was foreshadowed some 20 years earlier during Ray Wah's ingenious questioning of Black about the schoolgirl's disappearance. I suppose the only way a parent could prevent something like that happening is uh keep the child tied to the rape and string all the time, like, you know, virtually put them on a lead. Never let them out of their sight. It wasn't their fault, like, they couldn't have done nothing about it. Even to this day, Ray Wah's remarkable interviews with Black continue to fuel debate, not least of all as to the question, was redemption ever possible? He thought Black wasn't redeemable. Yeah. Yeah. It was too well practiced, too well rehearsed. It was part of who he was. Yeah, he, he was unloved, you know. He was pushed from pillar to post. He was uh, rejected. Um, there was no role model for him. So, and, and there were lots of missed opportunities to, to salvage him when he was salvageable. So he just went on and on and on and on until, you know, this was going to happen. He was going to live this life. So, so could he be redeemed after having murdered so many little girls? No, I don't think so. Those tapes, those sessions showed how, if you're prepared to spend the time and effort, you can understand, we can understand, why a man like Black develops into a serial child sex. <laughs>
His case serves as a stark reminder of the importance of thorough police work, the use of technology in investigations, and the collaboration of law enforcement agencies across jurisdictions in solving complex serial crimes. The legacy of Robert Black is one of darkness and despair, but also one of resilience and determination on the part of those who brought him to justice. It is a testament to the unwavering commitment of those who work tirelessly to protect the innocent and seek justice for the victims of such heinous crimes. The story of Robert Black serves as a stark reminder that even the most elusive predators can be brought to justice through the relentless pursuit of truth and the unwavering dedication of those who stand on the side of justice.